Welcome back, everybody, to our second session of the General Quality Audit and Monitoring Tool. Uh, today, it's going to be hands-on training. So how, how this day will run, we've uh, subdivided um, the entire workshop in, into three sessions. So during the first session, and each session is going to be structured in the same way, we have a small introduction um, to the features that we want uh, to introduce and then we have the breakout rooms where you can try this out and and also uh, where Sergi and me we will circle through the breakout rooms in case you have uh, any questions but you're also encouraged of course um, to help each other. Second session is going to be uh, dedicated to editing the content really now creating new questions adapting modifying existing questions and uh, again, breakout rooms and uh, you practice and we have a short break. And in the final one, it's about uh, getting ready for the launch. It's all about uh, the uh, privacy and data policy settings, which are um, well, they're a little bit confusing, but uh, I hope we can cover the basics. It might be that during this first uh, session, we actually we're going to be quite quick because it's not a big deal. So you should see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, a quick introduction to some of the things that we're dealing today when we're talking about, uh, as you know, the GAM is a template, so it comes pre-installed uh, with specific uh, question groups and questions. But of course, um, the key question is how can you customize this really to the context of your organization, which also is a reflection, of course, of the, of the broader national context. And I think there are four big questions that you probably have to, to address. So on the one hand, it's the language and the concepts. To which degree do they really, um, you know, uh, do they sound familiar and they are adequate to, to the situation you have in your country? In part, this is of course uh, covered by um, the tr translation that has been done. Um, but in part, it might be that you even need to further uh, adapt this. So for example, um, you will see later on, we have included a country specific um, classification of the scientific disciplines, for example. I mean, we used in the English version a specific classification of scientific disciplines in order to know where people know, what is their speciality. But these changes quite from country to country. And in some cases, such as the Polish one, for example, or in the Ukrainian one, uh, the translators have already incorporated <clears throat> a different classification. So this already exists. But in others, for example, the German one uses the English one and you have to see, um, you know, is this really adequate because it might even be different inside your specific organization. So I think on the one hand, we have to think about the language and the concepts that are used. The other thing then for the customization is really the legal context. So you as a survey, a potential service administrator, you're going to be the person responsible for the data that is going to be generated. So you'd have to double check if there are any specific legal requirements that you have to observe in your country. I know, for example, it's not the case that in Germany, you can't ask for uh, any indication of race, for example, you can't do that. We don't ask this in, in, the, in, in the questionnaire, but it's still, you might, you need to double check really that every data that you generate, that this is really on a firm legal basis. Um, Another thing that you have to think about in terms of customization is, of course, the organizational unit you want to address. Uh, you might be working in a very large university, but the survey is only going to be implemented in a faculty or even only in a small department. And then you have to think about if the questions that are included uh, really you know, work in this context or if you want to add an additional um, an additional question in order to be able also later on to make these uh, distinctions. Um, 
by default, there is none such questions, for example, no, let's see, let's, if you work in a university, in a big university, maybe you want to do this in two faculties. So, but since the GM by default does not know which faculties you have in mind, of course, you need to introduce this question and just to give respondents a chance to choose, you know, their organizational context, for example. And then you should also uh, make clear uh, the target population you're really addressing. So if you, again, work in a university, you might want to just target your academic staff. You might want to include uh, also the administrative staff and uh, cover all the employees that we have. Or in some cases, you might even have a specific subsection um, of the questionnaire that addresses the students. Um, from the outset, we haven't included very specific questions for students. So, I mean, the focus of the GM is really on the employees of the organization. Um, but it might be that you want to include also students and then, of course, it becomes uh, much bigger. And thinking about this also then involves really to think about uh, your target population, uh, think about how to reach them. Um, Usually in a university, it is relatively easy because HR has, should have the emails of all the people they're responsible for. Uh, and you can just, you know, reach them and send them uh, the email. But, um, but later on, we're going to see that different option, how, how to reach uh, your target population. So when we think about questionnaire customization, it's like these four different uh, aspects that you should keep in mind and and uh, revise in the end the questionnaire you set up and how much you know it needs to be adapted to these different things. There was a question during the first brief introduction of uh, the GM uh, regard, regarding uh, the sample and let me just introduce uh, a couple of key concepts. So when we talk about the population, we mean all units. Uh, this might be, generally speaking, you know, people or you want to sample from a list of nations or a list of companies. But in our case, of course, it's, uh, it's the employees. And uh, if it's a university, well, it's all people inside this university. So administrative stuff. Um, researchers, students, you know, everybody that is really related to this organization. So this would be our population. The sample then is like a segment of this population. So it's the subgroup you want to reach, for example, only the employees inside the university. And there is the important concept to observe. It's like the sampling error. And please, those people who have experience in statistics and the social science, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really, you know, it's quite um, important that you have a sense of how much the sample might be different from the actual uh, population. And I put in here three examples. Um, the truth is that for online surveys, basically, it's quite easy to address your, the whole population or the whole sample that you want to that you want to include, for example, all employees, because you have the email, you send it out. So there's no specific step involved, let's say, in terms of choosing or identifying the people that you want uh, explicitly to invite to participate in your survey. This happened previously, for example, if you have a, uh, if you want to do a questionnaire on, on paper, of course, this is much more cost intensive. So you really have to select very specific subsample to whom you send, you know, a copy of, of uh, the questionnaire. Since it's quite easy uh, doing it in electronic format, you specify whom you want to address and you send out the email. And then the sample error also includes, you know, the responses that you get. So it's like a self-selection that then happens and that might introduce a sampling error. And you see this in the second and third column. Um, it's quite 
if you if you look at if you look at the dots so there's like three groups let's say it's um the administrative staff it's the academic staff and it, there are the students so administrative staff usually you have more women represented by the green dots and less men could be a quite realistic situation and then you have the academic staff where you have uh, more men and uh, less women so you get a large sampling area for example in the last in the last uh, column where you see that uh, academic stuff mostly women have responded to your questionnaire and only one man whereas under the admin staff you have just two men and and one woman that has responded so if you then later on want to say something about you know uh, how if you want to draw conclusions how the result of your questionnaire relate to the whole population that you have in mind of course uh, it's very difficult because there's a it's, a it's a large area involved and i think you have the chance for the online uh, questionnaire this is the advantage of an online questionnaire that you can try to steer this a little bit i mean you probably have um, when you speak to hr department you should have a fairly good sense of uh, you know how many men and women for example work at uh, the academic work at academics at your university or how many men and women are on the administrative level so you get already you know you get a good picture of this distribution and then you can monitor as the respondents come in if there are any uh, strong deviations in this sense and you could try to then send out specific reminders or more targeted reminders and an invitation to to get a more balanced uh, respondent which is closer aligned to the real distribution of your whoever is your target group basically and whoever uh, is um, and and uh, the gender distribution okay so there was also a question on the sample size and this is quite a tricky one. I'm not a statistician, but we have good people in the group. So please, again, correct me if I'm wrong. This is just to give you a little sense of, you know, uh, the size of your sample you should be aspiring, let's say. And uh, it's also important to note that, you know, when you calculate the recommended sample, it really depends also what type of um, conclusion you want to draw. If the variable you are looking at and if for example is only a mean a sample mean or is it really about a proportion like here so a proportion an example for a proportion would be that uh, you have a population and you want to know you know what per part of this pro population uh, is for example immunized against covid right um, so if you have this type of question you need to calculate uh, the sample size for, for a proportion and you have to specify the margin of error so if you want to say you know uh, you expect that there are like 10 percent of the people who are immunized and you want to be five percent above and below um, this you have to specify the confidence level you have to identify and then um, you also um, can specify the size of the population when you think you know the over, overall size of your population let's say in terms of a university you could have a or a small research institute this could be 200 people overall working in your organization or it could be a really large university with 40,000 people yeah and uh, then you need also to specify the likely proportion that you expect so you think there's going to be a 10% people already immunized or if you don't know it you leave it in 50% and then you see there's a certain recommended sample uh, that you that uh, you can calculate so in one case in the small institute it's like 132 respondents you would need uh, and you also see if it's if the size the overall size of the population uh, doesn't really influence so much uh, the recommended sample for a really large organization is 381 um, what really influences uh, the sample size if, if you need uh, a smaller margin of error let's say one percent or the confidence level is higher like 99 percent this is really then influences the recommended sample um, 
take this with a cause with a with a note of of caution and uh i think it's always good uh to really talk about to to discuss these issues with uh statisticians who really understand um you know what's the best way to uh, specify the sample size so that you have a, a sense of you know if you have to push and add in another uh, wave of reminders to push a little bit the respondents or if you know your sample size is already quite good and which will allow you to say something about the representativeness of your results in relation to your whole population your whole organization but it's a sort of oriented figure okay let me just say a couple of words about the Lime survey platform. Uh, as you might know, it's a free and open so source survey software. It's open source, which means uh, the underlying code is uh, public. Everybody can uh, inspect it and, uh, and contribute as well. It's quite uh, reliable and sustainable. It's been around since 2003, so it's been gone through many cycles it's used by quite a lot of people which you also can see that there is extensive documentation available so the manual has been translated to different levels of course but it has been translated in many languages so there's uh, a good chance that it's also available in your language and uh, there's also a very good uh, community support so there are online discussion and forums where you can post uh, questions or look also for how to deal with any technical issues you might find it's also a very complete uh, survey software platform uh, where i think most of the features that you would expect are are included so you can do the question routing you know where you uh, set up different questions for different type of users for example it has a multilingual support which works very well and it has a large list of different uh, question types so i think it's uh, it, it's quite complete there are also two different ways how you can use lime say service the lime survey so on the one hand it's a cloud service so the foundation behind Lime Service, who is in charge of developing uh, the, the platform further, they offer a cloud service where you can contract, like similar to SurveyMonkey, for example, where you can just set up an account and then you have the questionnaire platform, which you can then uh, work with. This is how they basically uh, make their money. But then there's also the open source uh, software package which is hosted on github and you can download this software package uh, and if you have contracted your own hosting your own web page for example you can install the software platform there and uh, basically administer different service the number of service that you like there are then really no limits in in what you can do um, of course, it's technically more demanding, so you need to have basic notions of, you know, how to run a web server and how to make this really uh, secure. But if this is the case, then you don't have to pay any additional license fees, of course. Um, this is the thing that we did. We have uh, hosted this platform on our server. We have set up now two hosts with this. One is the one that we use in the ACT project for implementing the actual surveys. And now we have set up another one uh, for specifically for the training um, because we don't want to interfere uh, that uh, any running surveys with, your, with uh, the training. I think this is probably the most important slide of, of the day. So there are different uh, ways to get help on the one hand there is the giam manual and i would also ask then uh, sergi to post the um, url in the chat so it's a good thing to open this uh, manual in the browser so there's an interactive version which you can easily navigate um, and uh, basically the session today follows uh, the structure of this manual 
Then there's the actual Lime Survey manual on uh, you know how Lime Survey works. There are Lime Survey forums as well. This is probably if you have then more advanced questions. And we also run the GAM support mailing list. Um, if you really then will set up um, a, a GAM questionnaire, we will include you in, in this mailing list where are basically all the people who have run so far a GAM server, they're included. So if there are any questions or experiences, you can also you know, get in touch with all the other people. Um, and even if you don't set up uh, a GAM, if you want to be included on this mailing list, uh, just let us know. Okay, so let's get started with the practical part. Um, I have prepared here an identical copy. Can you see the, the Lime survey? You should, yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I have prepared an identical copy of a GAM that you should have access to. Uh, when you log on, you probably see a first, um, you know, uh, you should just see one item which says a Lime survey. You click on this and then you see the specific questionnaire. Um, don't be afraid of touching or moving anything. Um, do whatever you want. In the end, this is going to be uh, um, um, deleted further down the road. So there's not really anything. Or if there are any problems, we can, you know, reset uh, your account. So it's not, you know, don't be afraid to, to touch anything. So let me just start with introducing quickly the basic features of uh, the platform itself, the Lime Survey interface. As you can see, we're now inside uh, the, the Act Geam training. So this is the name that I've chosen for this um, instance, for this copy. And there's also the ID of the, of the survey, which, uh, well, helps you later on also I mean this will be the idea that runs throughout the report and everything so just to you know let you know there are basically two main features on the on the left you have the settings pane where you can like um, specify you know everything around the survey let's say so in terms of language the welcome message the data policy settings you see it there how it feels and looks um uh, the when you will publish it so these are all you know the, the settings of the survey and then if you click on structure you come to the actual questionnaire so i'm clicking here on working conditions so in the structure, this is where you edit the questionnaire, you know, specific questions, the type of questions you want to, you want to use. Um, you can also change the order here on, on the questions, while in the settings, it's all about, you know, the global settings, okay? What's important to understand at this stage as well is that you have here the preview survey, which basically lets you test your own survey. And you have here the preview question uh, group. If you are under the structure, you can preview in whatever language there is in your question, or you can preview a specific question group. What you see here, if you go in a structure, are the question groups. So there's a global variable division, social demographics, working conditions, and you see in each question group, the sub questions that, that are included. So in social demographics, for example, if you open that, you see that there are quite a few uh, sub questions, for example, in which year are you born, right? So this is the overall structure. It's important, the question group, because usually all the questions that are included in a question group will be presented on the same page when you fill out the questionnaire. This is also important because um, if people, uh, let's say, do not get to the very end of your questionnaire and submit everything, um, in, 
once they switch from one question group to the next, the data of the previous question group will be saved. So this then produces uh, a result set, which is not complete, where not all the questions have been answered, but only those of the last question group, let's say. An interesting feature here is as well, if you open different question groups, you see it gets quite long. You can also make this bigger or smaller here uh, to easily, you know, get everything together again is the collapse all question groups and you go back to where you started basically. Okay. There's also uh, important to know on this page. Let me just go into one. So there are two uh, modes how you can see your question. So one is the question overview. Let me just click on the question overview, which only gives you a quick summary of this question. So you know what's the code of it, how it's called, if it's mandatory or not, which type it is, um, and well, some more technicalities. But if you want to edit the question itself, itself it's a question editor, okay? So you, you switch between question overview and question editor. It depends how your account is configured. It might be that the first thing you see is the question summary, and then you switch to the question editor where you see everything. All right. I mean, this is, this is the basic um, structure, settings, and the questionnaire structure. Anytime you want to edit the questionnaire itself, you have to go to structure. If you want to set the overall settings, you are here. Um, adjusting global settings. So if we go to the global settings, you see that we have here the additional languages that are activated for your GAM. The survey owner, the administrator, administrative email address. So one of the first tasks later on will be that you already adapt this here. You delete the additional languages. So let's say I don't need the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Polish, and the Lithuanian, and the Ukrainian. So I just need the base language, which is English and German. And I change my name, let's say, and put in another email, which should be your email, of course. And then I save it. And in my new version, I will just have uh, the English and the German and all the other languages that I don't need and only make, you know, the questionnaire more and more expansive. They are deleted. Be sure that you really are, that you are really are sure which languages uh, you need, because once you've deleted those questions, you can't, re you can't uh, retrieve them again. What we would need then to do is, you know, to delete the whole questionnaire and uh, create a new copy. So uh, just be, be careful about this. The other next element are the text elements. And this is where it, you get to change the survey title. I mean, you see now there's a certain title set up in your account, but of course you are free to change this. And then you basically have two fields, which is the welcome message and uh, the end message. There's also a description field, but in the end, it's a little bit confusing. It's just, you know, it's like um, two text fields, which are above the welcome message. I, I just would recommend you to uh, insert the welcome message where you need to describe um, well, what your service is, uh, what your survey is about, um, why it is important, um, you know, just give a quick, quick introduction. What's the purpose and uh, of of this survey? The end message is if you want to introduce, you know, if you want to give a thank you message or um, tell people, you know, what's going to happen next. Uh, so this is the message. This is that's going to be displayed once people make their final submission. Of the questionnaire. So later on, this also will be um, a first task to introduce here a welcome message and an end message, change the title, 
And you have to be careful because now you see there's the English, the base language, but then there is also the only other active language that uh, I use. And in the same way that you introduce the English welcome message, you have to introduce the German welcome message. Um, in the corresponding tab so that there's going to really going to be, you know, content for whichever language version people choose to, to respond. And then you, you save it again. Another, another important part for, of this general settings is the data policy settings. Uh, usually, you know, before you start, before respondents can start to respond to your questionnaire, they have to accept the data policy settings. So there is a data policy text included by default in the GAM template. This still mirrors uh, a little bit the context of the act and the communities of practice. Uh, this will change in the newer versions where we make this more generic that also people who want to run the survey, but who are not part of uh, an act community of practice, uh, that is, this is gonna be adapted. Um, but in any case, you need to fill in, there are certain uh, lines marked in yellow, which you need to fill in. So you need to fill in your name, organization and email address because you're the survey administrator uh, who's taking responsibility for, for the data. Later on in the third session, we will also quickly talk about um, the anonymization settings. So there are different anonymization settings of which data will be collected, which have like predefined blocks of text. So you have to choose which one you're gonna choose and delete the other ones. And then again, you know, your, your email and your name as the one who um, takes responsibility for this. Again, this has been translated for you already. So the, this the data protection policy is already a, available in German. But again, you also have to edit uh, the same text here. You have basically several options of how this data policy text will be displayed on the first page, on the landing page of your survey. So you can either say don't show, and then it's really that you don't have this uh, data policy settings, which is really not an option for the game. Or you do an inline text or a collapsible text. Collapsible text means that initially the whole length of this text is hidden so people don't see it. There's a link, if they want to read the details, they can open it. And then there's a default checkbox which comes with a text, which is in here in the survey data policy checkbox label that they have to click before they actually can then start the, the survey. So you can adapt this also. Um, and in any case, if you really want to see how uh, this looks in action, you just have to go preview survey and it would generate a new window for you where you can see how this really looks and works in, in for real. There's also a survey data policy error message that you might want to adapt, which is shown when people try to, you know, um, uh, start the questionnaire without uh, checking the data policy settings. Okay, so these are the basic three, um, the basic basic settings at this stage. Let me just also mention to you a very important feature, which is the display and export button. So if you click on the display and export, you see here there are different um, options. Once you have a version of the questionnaire you like, and you want to even just save for yourself, um, you can export the questionnaire with a survey structure file. It's a .lss file. You export this and it will be saved to your uh, computer. So this makes sense. Uh, for example, you know, it's just a, a backup 
of your questionnaire. So if at a later stage anything goes wrong during the preparation of the questionnaire or after you have finished the whole survey and you want to save your questionnaire for a future because you want to do it again in a second version uh, a couple of years down the road, you export here the questionnaire structure which will then allow you to import it in the future and have it exactly as you configured it uh, in the past and how you used it in the past. It's so important also to say that this does not include any data that might have been submitted. So you can export the questionnaire at any point, even once you have launched the survey live. It just is really the, the structure of this. This also makes sense if you want us, for example, to set up or create a new copy for your questionnaire in, in, in that you adopted. So you export it, they send it to us, and we uploaded it into our platform. Especially, and this is also important, especially since um, for the current host that we use, we don't really proceed to run the surveys. The surveys say there, here, and the one, this is more for training. So if you then later on want to launch your actual survey to your organizations, uh, you need to export this, send it to us, and we create an instance for you uh, this is on the on the real platform to launch the survey. Also, I mean, you might have noticed that on the one you're using, uh, the connection is currently not encrypted. In the other one that we're using for real, you know, the data, the connection is encrypted. So it's also a security measure. Okay. So let me stop here. This is like the basic um, the basic setting. The second part now is all about editing question groups and questions, different options. Um, there was one question uh, from the last session regarding if you can import a questionnaire on your own servers. Of course, you, you can do this. The only thing is you, the version of the question of the Lime server platform has to be uh, similar so they have currently a version 3.26 which is like the long-term support we're using a new version we're using the version 4.5 i think and um, i think you need a, this version 4 at least in order to be able to import the questionnaire but uh, otherwise it should work fine and no problem. Uh, one thing that I forgot during the past session. So you see when you are on overview in the settings on overview, you see here, share your survey. So the URL you find here, you can copy these and uh, send around and anybody with access to this uh, URL can browse your questionnaire. It's the same way that it works that we share uh, the GAM for you to browse, the existing one. So these are the different URLs under which people can reach this. While your survey is not active, so while it's in editing mode, people can browse it still, but they can't submit data. Or they can try, but it doesn't get saved, basically. But it's a good way, you know, to just if you want other people to take a look at your questionnaire, it's easy to, to share this, really. And there's one for each of your active languages, which is basically, you see at the end, it's a DE or EN. Okay. Um, now let's go to, if you really want to edit the content of your questionnaire. Um, as I said, there are two... The way it's structured, it's basically by question group, which, which um, all the questions contained in a question group will be displayed on the same page. Um, you can change this globally. You can also choose another way of getting people to navigate through your questionnaires, like after, like they have to press a button for each question, and then you know they come to the next one. But usually I think it's recommendable to put the same thematic questions in one group that people get a, as an overview as well where, where they are. Uh, each question group, I mean, if you click on it on the left, you see it comes here as the question group editor. 
So you can put in a title. Uh, now we are in working conditions about your current job. Uh, you can put in a description that will be displayed or hide it. I mean, by default, it will be displayed so that people, you can give people uh, specific instructions or background information about all the questions that you have in this group. And uh, that's it. Again, there is uh, my English version. And then uh, if I want the German version, it's also there already translated. Again, if you make any changes on this, you need to um, make sure that this is the same in all your languages. Then one thing um, for uh, the order, it's quite easy to change the order of whole question groups and of uh, questions themselves. In order to change the order, you have to be aware that there's a small icon up here, unlock question organizer. Currently it's locked, so I can't really move things, you see, can't move them. But if I unlock this, I can change the question order simply by dragging them, uh, by dragging them wherever I want them to be. Okay, so this is quite straightforward. It's also interesting if you want to then create later on a new question, usually it's at the bottom of it and then you just move it wherever you want. In order to avoid like uh, changes, accidental changes, you can then again lock it because usually, I mean, the question order is not something that you should um, you know, uh, you will be adding this all the time. Okay, so if we go to a specific question, you just again, you click on it, and then let me tell you a little bit more about uh, all the options here. You, you see it's a quite complete uh, screen, and uh, let's break it down. I think the first important element really that I want to highlight is the question code. Now you see the question codes are also, you know, this is, these are the references that, um, that we use uh, for each question. And uh, in the past, we had the experience that some people uh, changed all the question codes to make them something more, you know, order or, or um, look more readable, let's say. The thing is, uh, if you change the question codes, you can do this, of course, but it has a disadvantage. If you want to use later on the reporting template that we've prepared, it will not work anymore. Uh, because we use the question code is basically uh, the columns in your result data matrix, the name of the column. And we use this in order to know which column and which type of data we are uh, converting into a frequency table or in, in the charts, of course. And if you change these codes, this won't work anymore. So if you can avoid it, uh, don't touch the question codes because later on the question codes, you can hide them to your respondents. So they are not visible and uh, they will just be visible the question numbers. Usually as you have question one, two, three, four, five, uh, this is then no problem, okay? Then the next important thing, of course, I mean, uh, the text elements and help, this is quite uh, self-explicatory. I mean, the question, you know, it's a text here, and then you can provide also a help text, which usually is displaced right beneath uh, the question. In this case, for example, since we're asking about the current position, we only give three positions and we give some instructions of what we understand by these positions, okay? All right, um, then the next important thing is uh, the question type here. So there are many different question types pre-selected. If you click to here, you see, you know, they're different, they're grouped according to single choice questions, arrays, multiple choice questions, text questions, mass questions, and so on and so forth. I mean, we're not gonna go now into the details there. Later on, when we create a new question, uh, there's actually a feature where you where it shows you an example of how the different question types look. So it's gonna be easier to select the adequate one. Then you get here again, the question group. You see this matches with, uh, just close this again here. Uh, no, this one was a question. 
So this matches with your working conditions about your current job. So you can switch a question also here. Um, if you want another field, there might be, you know, um, exactly, you, you offer the option that people can introduce uh, other. There is mandatory, if this question is mandatory or not, between on and soft, it means on is people will not be able to proceed to the next page if it's mandatory and soft means uh, they will there will be an alert, but if they still choose to ignore this question, they will not impede their advancement, okay? Uh, encrypted means if the result of this will be stored encrypted in the database, which usually I don't think it's necessary because people don't have access. I mean, later on the result that I said also can be encrypted uh, in, in itself, let's say. Um, safe default value, you don't have default values and, and then also the clear default values. If you want to show one certain answer option pre-selected, you can do this here as well. The next section, the important section is really down here. It's the answer options. This is where you get to find, for example, in this case, you have a pre-selected categories, right? We have academic researcher, technician and administrative. And this is a section where you can uh, edit these or add new ones. Um, and this section also changes depending on the question types you choose. This is a, a single select, so there's only one possible answer. But for example, if you have an array question where you have sub questions and an answer scale, so all these things you will need to adjust down here. Um, Basically, in the, 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 in the GAM, we have uh, several types of questions. So one, let me just show you uh, a type. This is a, I oh, don't know. This is a, uh, sociodemographic uh, question it's in which year were you born and the input is an input field which is maximum has four characters and the minimum value is 1920 where we say so you already have a, a validation put in there that when people put in there uh, in the year they are born you know that they can only put in uh, maximum four characters a certain minimum value and integers only. So you can control a little bit uh, what's um, minimize the errors, let's say. Um, we had an example of a categorical variable, you know, where you have one single options, for example, your role, technician, administrative and researcher. Uh, let me show you also a multiple choice question, which we have in um, here eleven B, it's the forms of leaf. Which of the following forms of leave have you taken or are you currently taken? I think this is not actualized now, isn't it? But it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's what matters is what we have here. So it's the different forms of leave that people have taken. And this is really a multiple choice. Maybe you remember now. So this looks different from the numerical one because I don't put in a textbook inside. So it's, it's really dependent on the type of question that you use. Let me just reload this because it doesn't, I mean, this is not correct. It doesn't actualize, doesn't show the actual, it should be multiple choice here, multiple choice. This one, this would be the correct one. And let me also show you the option for a, an array question, which would be, for example, the parental leave options. Um, let's 
So this is parental leave. This one we have here, please indicate the availability of following options either before, during, or upon your return from your most recent current parental leave at the organization. So this is a, an array. And you see now here it has sub questions and answer options. So the sub questions are the different options, uh, measures that you might have chosen during your parental leave. And the answer options are now an answer scale. So I do not know if this is available. I know it's not available. I know that this is available, but I have not used it. I have used it. So when this generates then a matrix, if you want to preview this question, how it looks, you can just go to the preview section and then you see, so this is really the array that is generated from the sub questions and the answer scale. Okay. So these are the, the four big different types of questions that we use. And let me also point you to one question that needs to be edited. For example, about your current job. This is WCJC001, which is which of the following best describes your post? If you hold multiple positions, please select the most senior. And this question is a, uh, is a drop down question which has currently no answer options because we think this question is really very specific to your organization. So you would need to edit this question later on also in the task and put in here, uh, you know, replace these placeholders, add new ones in order to fill it out with the different job descriptions that make sense in your organization. We also included here in the note for the survey admin, this means for you, please update with organization specific listings. So this is the first step that you later on have to um, do to yeah, provide the right questions here. Okay, so how do you provide, this is how you edit an existing question. You know, you just change anything here and then you save it. I mean, that's not, not a big deal. How do you create a new question? The best way to do this is um, if you, browse the uh, question group where you want to add your question. So you go to the question group and then you have here the add question. It generates a code for you. You can either, you know, use this code directly or invent your own code. The only important thing is that it doesn't really um, get duplicated, that it doesn't duplicate any existing code. And then let's make a single choice list drop down or a list radio question where we ask about uh, organizational division. So let's say we want to, you know, this is a university, we were running the survey and we want to know from which faculty in which faculty they are located. So we put in here a question text and then down here you would add, I don't know, faculty of chemical engineering, I don't know, this exists, it doesn't really matter. I mean this, and you add another one, faculty of social science and so on and so forth. And then you save it and that's basically quite straightforward how you uh, create this question. You can preview the question and you should see it now it's located in the first, as the first question in this section. If you want to change the order, you just, you know, drag it to the place where you want it to be. There we go. Okay. This then later on will also be your task. You might want to think, you know, if there's a subdivision inside your organization, you, you want to uh, get it. Okay, there's another option. You might want to uh, import questions that already exist. This you do by, as you see here, when you are in working conditions about your current job, 
you say, okay, I want to add another question. And then you have here right at the top import question. Um, later on, let me just the, 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 the task that you will have to do is you have to create a new question group, which I already did here, beliefs and bias. And we're going to import there an existing question that you find the link you can download. You should have in the task uh, description in the PDF, but I think Zarshi can also post this in the chat. There's a link where we prepared for you a question that you can import. So basically what you do, the import the question, you download it first, then you choose it in the, um, you select it on your computer where you saved it, you open it, you say automatically rename the question code if it already exists. So because the question codes have to be unique, convert the resources link, it doesn't really matter because there are not resources associated. And then you jump to it, you say import, and you find this specific questions imported. Uh, this is a scale for self-ascribed gender identity, traditional masculine or feminine roles. There's a paper behind it if you want to look at it and uh, you can now preview the question, which is in English. So you see that uh, this is a scale that has been developed by these people, Kachel and uh, a couple of colleagues, uh, how people they consider themselves as totally masculine, you know, slightly masculine, neither nor or moderately totally feminine, uh, according to uh, certain things here. This now is integrated in your um, this now is integrated in your, oh no, I didn't save it. <laughs> so don't forget to save your question and then it should be integrated into uh, the specific question group. Okay. Um, deleting question, I mean, it's quite straightforward. Uh, I just want to highlight the questions that you should delete probably. And this, these are located in the working conditions about your current job. There you have two or three questions. Actually, I, I deleted one just before the start of the session. So this is a WCJC003, which in English is in which academic field do you mainly work? Now, this changes considerably the subcategorization of the scientific of the academic fields is very country specific and um, we've provided from our colleagues from our colleagues in poland they've created their own uh, subcategorization of academic fields which now doesn't really make sense because i only have english and german but this is a question in polish with their english translations um, um, with the subdivisions that make sense in Poland. If you don't need this, of course, you can uh, delete this question. Um, so you go to question overview, you delete it. And uh, it has disappeared. The same holds for uh, Lithuanian. It's also a very country specific uh, subdivision. So we can also delete this one if you're not going to use the, the Lithuanian version, of course. And uh, that's it. So now it's only the English one, but in the same way, of course, you might want to adapt the, the, the English one and introduce a new one for your own. Before we start with the, the before we start with the practice one more thing you see here the global variable definitions um i think it, it's a good thinking behind it but uh, it's a little bit complicated the thing is that you should choose for your gm the organizational unit so if we go to the answer options here you see we have pre-selected different organizational units, depending on if you want to address this 
to an entire organization, an institution, faculty, department, office, a research unit, an institute, and you could place others here, um, which really, you know, are more fitting for your, for your context. Several questions and sub-question items of the questionnaire make explicit reference to a, the organizational unit. So one question is, for example, in the training opportunities, let me just quickly switch to training opportunities. So you see here in the description, training opportunities are important for a career advancement. Please tell us about your current or past training opportunities in your current, and then this is a, a variable here, var or type shown. This makes reference to the organizational unit you have chosen. So depending on the, re in the reference unit, the actual questionnaire within there will show either organization, department, faculty, research unit, or whatever. So since we use this very specific references at several places, let me also show you one in the uh, sub question Spare one if i go to the sub questions here you see in general men and women are equally represented in terms of numbers in my of course it's very important that people have a clear understanding of what you to what you refer here it's going to be different maybe at the organization at the university level if you put this question forward in terms of the university or a specific faculty or department i mean this might change a lot so this is why it's important um, to think carefully what's going to be the reference unit for your survey which target population you want to reach and then select this set this globally for the whole survey here and the way you do this is you go into wow archetype here, you edit this question, you change to the question overview and edit the default answer. Okay. So now you see here, the default answer is a placeholder check. And you have again here, all the options, department, office, research unit. So let's use research unit, use same default value across languages and you save it. And this means now all places in your questionnaire where we have this variable, you will see research unit selected. If this is too complicated, if you think, you know, this is a, is a little messy, what you also can do is to just edit this by hand and go through, uh, edit all the different places where you see this var org type, this, this variable definition and replace these values by hand. But it might be quite a lot of work if you think that you have maybe three different language versions, because you have to do this for every language version that there is in the survey. So this is then a, a quicker way to set this reference variable. Okay, let me stop here. Let's start with the final session. Um, just going over the chat and seeing some of the questions. There is some confusion for the organizational reference unit. Uh, the idea behind is that it lets you select uh, or, or specify, set the context for certain questions. Um, if you are if you're working in a big university and uh, let's say you might only want to implement the GAM in a specific faculty and people will respond to a question on how do you see the distribution of men and women in your, uh, well, then the question is what in your overall organization? So the university as a whole or in the faculty where I'm a professor of physics, let's say, right? So, I mean, it, the answer might be quite different because in physics, there's a severe underrepresentation of women and in the overall organization, it's actually quite balanced. So in some, for some questions, you need to set, make it very clear to what unit the question refers. And we have inserted this with a variable because it might change. It depends on, on how you want to use the GM. Some will use it in the faculty. Some will use it even in a small research institute. And then the question might refer to, I don't know, your research group or um, 
And a quick and easy way to, to set this reference unit is via this global variable that you can uh, specify before you launch the survey. And let me just show you again how this is done because it's a little bit tricky because the things are, are hidden. Um, let, me sh let me share my screen. So you are inside the structure you have here the global variable definitions and there is the var or type. The way you set this, it's like a normal question type as any other question type. Uh, but basically what you do, you set the default answer for this. And you have to switch here from the question editor to the question overview. And in the question overview, you see that the, bot, the, the buttons you use, you, you have available above change. So question editor, you know, it's save, save, close. And if you go to question overview, you can set uh, the, the conditions, copy this question or edit the default answer. So you go into edit default answer. And here it shows you all the different options that we have that we offer by default. So you now say, okay, no, 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 my questionnaire is going to be only distributed in the faculty of physics or whatever. So I said faculty, you use the same across all the languages, you have here the other languages. So in German, it's Fachbereich, then or Lithuanian, I don't know, Spanish, it's Departamento, which shouldn't be, it's Facultad. So you make sure that it's the same throughout all the languages and then you save it, which then means wherever in the question text where you see this var or type, this strange thing, once you launch the survey, uh, there will be faculty or department or wherever that you've chosen. You can also, if there's a unit that you want to use, but which is not listed yet, you go to the question editor again to the answer options and you just add it here. You can delete also the ones that you don't want. And this is basically how it works. Don't be afraid if you preview a question and it doesn't show up. Uh, I think there are some internal issues with the platform, but uh, once you launch it, it works. So you really will see the, the one you, you selected. And then there was also an interesting thing that we had uh, discussed in another subgroup, which was about um, if there are questions or question groups that you think that are lacking and missing, of course, this goes back, we have set up a database on the main GAM site, so the geam.actongender.eu, where you could download or should have, <laughs> where you could download a question. This is um, a draft, let's say, but what we really want to do, if you develop a module or a question that you think that is missing and you want to share it, so you can upload it to this database and others, then you can provide a description. Um, you can, you know, um, well, add additional information, how this has been applied or worked in your context, in your questionnaire. And then it will be available for others to download it and import it in their uh, questionnaire if they want to use it because of course it's going to be the Lime server structure file which is easy to import and export the whole thing so um, as you've seen it's it doesn't really work yet as supposed the downloading is a little bit cumbersome but uh, I hope we get to fix this and then you know have a repository of, of modules and even entire questionnaires um, for others to take a look and learn from and adapt and use. Okay, so um, what I want to do in the in the last session now is a little bit tricky, or it's it's the more most complicated but also very important. It's all the settings you have to do before you launch your questionnaire. These are the settings related to the data protection, the anonymization. And uh, there are many options that Lime Survey offers, and it's still confusing for us as well sometimes of what happens when you combine the different options. Uh, what we've done, we've tried to simplify this into three 
different data policy settings, which we call it's a, a strict privacy setting, a moderate privacy setting, and a comfort privacy setting. So these are the three big uh, groups which correspond to, uh, well, specific checkboxes and, um, and options that I will explain now to you in a little bit more detail. I highly recommend that you open um, the online manual, the online GIA manual, because I don't really remember now exactly how these, all the options correspond to these three big blocks, but it's really detailed in, in, in the manual, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I explain now the different options, and then later on, um, I think we also have the opportunity in, in the breakout rooms if you have specific questions on, on how this works and what are the implications, and we'll try to respond as much as possible to this. But I think it's quite, um, it's quite complex. Okay, so we go back to the, to the settings. You should be able to see my screen. Um, we have uh, in the settings, we have the data policy settings and we get back to that. But there are different sections where you really um, can choose how the whole survey will be presented to people, what they see, what they can do and also how their data is stored in the database. So let's start with the presentation. In the presentation, basically, you can give participants the options if uh, they are allowed to jump between the different sections in your, in your questionnaire. So you see there, show question index, allow jumping. It's either disabled, so people can only go forward, and let's say, and if you present the results on a per question group basis, they can advance from question group to question group, okay? Once they have entered a new question group by pressing next, they can't go back. They can't modify what they submitted already, okay? If you say incremental, it means that people advance. They cannot jump, they cannot jump one question group and go from the first to the fifth, for example. It's just sequential. However, what they can do is once they have advanced, they can go back to modify what they've done previously, okay? And if you say full, it means that respondents will see at the top right of their screen, they will have a drop-down menu with all the different uh, groups, question groups, so they can jump from the first to the fifth to the last, they can jump back and forth um, however they like. This is the default setting that we use in the GM questionnaire because we don't really have a specific philosophy behind this, but I think it's, it's, it's nice that you already see, you know, what is included in different sections. And it might be a problem if you really insist that uh, the questions that are mandatory, because you might have a page in the middle where there are mandatory questions but if you give people the option to jump from the first to the third, let's say, and their mandatory question in the second, um, they can jump this question and you might end up with empty fields, which, um, yeah. So a good option is also, I mean, I think I'm actually the most common option used by many is incremental. So you can always, um, you can go back, but you can't jump forward which gives you pretty much control over the mandatory fields. So they, because they can't advance if they don't have filled out the mandatory fields in, in their questions, okay? Show group name uh, and or group description. This is basically the group title and the description that you provided. You can show or hide this. In the GM, it's always uh, visible because we give instructions and the contextual information, what's contained in the group. And then another important one is the show question number and or code. This is what I said previously. Here you can uh, set if people will see while they respond the question code, you know, this WJC, whatever. Or if they see only uh, sequential numbering, one, two, three, four, five. Or if they don't see anything, they just see uh, the title, okay? Then there are some uh, explanatory options as well on the right. So the, uh, 
you can turn on and off if people see how many questions there are really uh, in, in, in the questionnaire. The welcome screen, I mean, should be on because it's, you know, where is your welcome message? Allow backward navigation. So this is one of these issues where you say, okay, so I say incremental and I still can turn off the backward navigation. Sometimes you also have to try it out a little bit, you know, if, if the combinations really uh, work. And then there are uh, the progress bar, of course, um, can turn on and off, show on screen keyboard. Sometimes, you know, uh, if people don't have, I don't know, special you know, language specific keyboards or something like that, you can turn this on and off. Uh, and then other things that are usually turned off show public statistics. So usually we don't turn this on, you know, people know how many people have responded or things like that. Okay. Okay, so this is the first setting. Then the participant settings. Here, basically, um, the most important thing is the anonymized responses. Anonymized responses means um, when you turn this on, that Lime Survey tries to make this as anonymous as possible. Uh, this goes back to the issue of uh, disclosure control that we had also in the first um, session. Lime Survey collects certain meta information, um, including the time when a respondent submitted this. Uh, this might already be give you a hint of who responded. And if you turn on anonymization here, it means they use a generic date, 1980, let's say, for submission. Uh, and any other meta information is not collected. So if you need to have this as strictly anonymized as possible, you have to turn this on, right? Um, because it basically eliminates all um, meta fields that Lime Survey usually collects. Uh, with your with with the re respondents, um, the access token. This has to do. With, this only uh, kicks. This only comes. This is only applied if you use a participant table, and I explain shortly then what this means. So for the moment, let's ignore this. Uh, enable participant-based response persistent. This means that. Uh, people, you know, there's a, an, a session will be set between the respondent and the survey platform, which keeps track of who is responding. This makes sense if people want to come back later to their survey, let's say they, you know, uh, they fill out the survey, then they have to, they, they get a call or anything, and then they have to leave and they want to come back to the survey and pick up where they left it the other day. So you need to put this on for in order that, that this works, that the data that you have already entered is not lost. Allow multiple responses or update responses one access code. This means if respondents are really personalized, this includes this participant table, there's usually a unique ID and identifier to this. And um, if you want to use this, if you want to share this between different people, which is a little bit counterproductive because it's really a unique idea, you know, it doesn't make sense. But if you want to share this between different people, so you have to put this on. Allow public registration. It's also if you want people to register before they can enter. So they have to provide their email, for example, or they um, their name. You can also uh, activate this. Okay. Notification and data management settings. So these here you have more specific control over the meta information you want to collect. So one is the date stamp, when people start the submission and when they do the final submission, because they might start now and then send it off, I don't know, five hours later or even the next day. So there's like two data fields for that. The IP address from where people respond um, well, well, I don't know. Anonymized IP address. I'm not quite sure now what this specifically does. Oh, I'm sorry, I would have to look this up. 
because if you turn it off, you know, I mean, there's no, it doesn't make sense to anonymize it anymore. Um, save the referrer. So you might send out a referrer in an email and it says where people click on the link of the survey and this will be saved and save the timings. This inserts how long it takes for people to reply to your survey. So in some cases, this might be interesting for you because you get a sense how long is the average duration that it takes to fill out the questionnaire. This might be very interesting while you test your, your, your survey initially um, to see how long it takes. And then here you see enable assessment mode. This is really, uh, it's also the Lime survey is used for, you know, running tests and, and scoring and stuff like that. So it's not really, it does not really apply for the game. And participants might save and resume later, depending on how you have put your anonymization settings. This means that even if you have completely anonymized, but enable the persistence of responses and allow people to save their um, uh, current state, people can do this actually, okay? Okay, then usually the other things here, I mean, this is not active Google Analytics settings. If you want, you can activate this for your account, but uh, this is not done by default. And finally, you can specify the start date time and expiry date time. So you can specify when the survey will be available and when it will be offline. Usually what we have here is a uh, list survey publicly. No, because it will show up. We, we don't want anybody just, you know, who happens to land on the main page of the survey platform to participate. So we don't want this to be public. It might be for some types of questions, but not for the survey, for the game. And then set cookie different read. I mean, this allows you to create a session to really track and maintain the ID between uh, the respondents and the platform. And then you can also, if you have enabled that people can actually register um, um, before they respond. So you have there a CAPTCHA, which is these things, you know, where you have to identify bridges or, or stuff like that in order to prevent spam submissions. But this is usually not the case as well um, for the, for the GIAM. So these are the settings. Let me just also um, tell you about the third, this other option, which is survey participants or the participant table. This basically means that you have the options. If you, if you work in a small research institute, for example, and there are 200 people and you have all the email of all the people and it's fine, you want them you want them to invite them directly in a personalized email. So you upload uh, the CSV of those people with their emails and names. And then you can, on the one hand, send personalized reminders, but also send, um, make a very personalized tracking of the respondents because each of the respondent will have the personalized ID and the system will know if they have responded fully or only like part of it which then allows you to send very specific reminders. Um, with the experience we had in this one, but also in other questionnaires, I mean, this is really the best option if you want to have a good response rate, because, um, you know, you can really address people by their, by their first name, dear, make it very, look very, very personalized. And also you don't need to um, bother people that have responded with uh, several waves of reminders because the system knows who has already responded. And then, you know, you can send out a specific reminder, even make references to the first reminders that you send. Um, and this gets then really the best uh, response. This doesn't mean that the, uh, it's like two tables then in the Lime survey platform. On the one hand, you have the respondents, you know, their names and emails, but this doesn't mean that this information is then copied one-to-one -one into your result matrix. In your result matrix, there still will be anonymized, anonymized responses in terms of there's no first names, no emails, no IDs involved. Of course, if you are the survey admin and you have access to the survey matrix, you have all the meta information in there, let's say IPs, timing and stuff like that. 
you could, if you wanted, identify people. So it's not 100% anonymized. But I mean, this then goes with the ethics of the research you do, right? I mean, if you are really want to uh, re-identify certain people and point them out, I mean, you know, uh, of course you can you can make this effort, but uh, that's not really the purpose, right? So just to just to be sure, I mean, this is an option where which we label the comfort thing because it really allows a very comfortable tracking of participants. Uh, we have defined the moderate uh, privacy settings at those where you collect the meta information, let's say, where you enable that people can, you know, uh, easily leave the questionnaire and pick up at the later point in time. So there's a session ID involved and stuff. Um, but it's not totally anonymized. Or you have the option to do a strict, um, select the strict most uh, restrictive mode, which is total anonymization. But then you're also a little bit more blind, really, in terms of, uh, you know, who already might have in terms of tracking. If we go back to the thing about the sample and you see, well, do the responses we get more or less match our actual population in terms of, you know, men and women in different staff categories, it's going to be a little bit more, more difficult. Um, so, yeah, and what makes it difficult also is that also we provide these three big groups. Actually, you have to, you know, set these, adjust the settings according to the policy you, you choose. So if we go back to the data policy settings and to the text, you see here that we've basically prepared three, three, um, different blocks. So one is the anonymized response. If you go back to the data policy and the survey policy message. So one is anonymized response. One is anonymized response with tracking mode. And the third is anonymized response with participant table. Okay. Depending on which you choose, you need to delete the two other ones and be sure to just leave the one in which really applies for your context. And how these two things match, the text here and uh, the individual setting, this is described in the manual. That is why I say, you know, you should open the, the, the GM manual where you sort of have the correspondence which specific uh, notification, publication, participant settings correspond to this, uh, the text that you choose in the data. And if you are unsure what this really means, I mean, here is really explained you know, what information, additional information is stored in, in, in each case. Okay. Um, okay. So one other thing before we go into subgroups and where we can uh, discuss this a little bit further, I guess, is also, let's say you activate the survey and actually, it asks you about some of these settings again when you activate the survey. So you see, I don't know going to activate now, but here again, you have, you know, these basic settings that you need to choose again, anonymized responses, safe IP address, safe timing, state stamp, anonymized IP address. So again, you, you know, just to be sure that you, that these are the right ones. You activate the survey and go back to the training. Um, once you deactivate the survey, how you how you deactivate the survey, you have two options, basically. One is you expire the survey. And one is deactivating the survey. And, and the meaning is quite different. It's, in the, it's impor important to understand the difference. Deactivate, expire a survey simply means that people cannot participate anymore. Okay, it's still there. It runs, um, but people cannot uh, participate anymore. And it's important to download the data while it's in this state. I mean, you can download the data during any time it's active or once it expired. And the expiration is the expiry date here. You expire the survey simply by, you know, either choose a date uh, 
in the past. And it's important because if you deactivate a survey, um, basically you won't be able to download your results anymore. Okay, because um, deactivating puts your survey back into editing mode. This means you can change, you know, questions, add new questions, remove questions, and of course the structure of the survey then changes. And the results are not going to be the same then because you have a new column then or remove a column. So uh, it's important to understand this difference. So I think this is more or less the, the overview. And uh, I think now it would be, we use again the breakout rooms and um, just try to, you know, maybe adjust these settings for your specific instance. And if you have questions, well, let's let's address them there. Or maybe there are some questions now which are global, and we should maybe have a quick round while we are in the plenary. There's actually not so much practice now involved, you know, because it's a bit it's rather understanding. <clears throat> sorry, it's rather understanding what's behind it than actually then pressing a few buttons. Well, so thanks a lot. It's been a long morning. Hopefully, I mean, at least for a start, uh, useful and. Uh, we will see each other next time and be in contact in the meantime.